Good morning, everyone. We're going to get started in just a moment. We're just waiting for a few more people to trickle in and then we'll, we'll make a start. Great. I think, I think we're ready to go. So yeah, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our final Illuminate event of the year. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Johnson. I'm going to be your host for today, and I'm the Employer Partnerships Manager here at Bright Network. So we always love to see your faces on these calls. So if you feel comfortable to do so, then please do turn on your cameras and give us a big wave. Um, we also have our colleague Anu on the call. Um, Anu, give a big wave, say hello. Hi. <laughs> She'll be making sure that all of your questions are answered throughout today's session um, by our fantastic lineup of panelists. So please do send all of your questions directly to Anu using the chat, chat function on the right hand side. So for today's webinar, we have decided to focus on the topic of social mobility. Uh, we work with well over 200 employers each year, helping them to connect with our network of 280,000 students and graduates. And in the last couple of years, we've seen employers really increase their efforts to attract and recruit candidates from a low socioeconomic background. Many employers have been taking important steps to make their recruitment process and their organizations more inclusive for disadvantaged candidates, such as scrapping certain educational requirements, moving to strengths-based assessments, reducing the number of places allocated to internal referrals, and crucially targeting candidates from a much wider range of universities, including those, I'm pleased to say, outside of the Russell Group as well. As we'll be showcasing today, employers have made a lot of progress in this area, but I think there's still quite a lot of work to do. According to an article on Personnel Today, only 36% of top UK employers are currently setting social mobility targets. And each year, we conduct research with 7,000 of our student and graduate members, um, and 80% of the respondents of that research are state educated. And we ask them the question, have you gained any work experience whilst at university? And we found that state educated students were the least likely group to have gained formal work experience, such as internships or spring week um, kind of activity. However, they are more likely than private school members to have undertaken part time work. So if you are looking to improve social mobility, it's perhaps worthwhile making sure that your hiring managers are aware of this and count that type of work experience as important as well. We also asked our members, are you confident about securing a role after university? And we found that state school members were less optimistic about securing a role than average. And this difference in confidence has no, no doubt been exacerbated by the impact of COVID-19. And so we'll also be exploring that in today's session as well. So we, before we dive into today, today's agenda, we're really excited about relaunching our Illuminate webinars in 2021, but we really want your help to make sure that we're making them relevant and that they're really kind of tailored to, to what you want to uh, hear about. So I'm just going to ask you to take a minute to just send your suggestions on the topics you want us to focus on for next year to Anu. So if you could just ping Anu a quick message with your suggestions on what you want us to, to focus on next year. That would be great. We've given you a couple of examples there, you know, gender, well-being, but please feel free to think outside of the box and just let us know what's gonna, what you're going to really appreciate as well. So yeah, you, you can do that now, but also throughout the session, just ping your ideas to, to Anu and we, we really do appreciate that. Okay, so on today's agenda, we are going to be kicking off with a keynote from Kate Lander, who is the CEO of Ivy House, and they specialize in delivering leadership and talent development programs for emerging talent and, and beyond. We will then go into a panel discussion in which Kate will be joined by two Bright Network members, Josiah and Hilary. They're going to provide their perspective from a kind of candidate experience of, you know, accessing opportunities with employers. 
And they will also be joined on the panel by Christine, who works at Legal and General and is the co-chair of their social mobility network, and Ashleen, who is the early careers manager at Clyde & Co. Um, and then finally, what we'll do is we'll dedicate the last few minutes of the session to making sure that all of your questions are answered. So yeah, it gives me great pleasure now to welcome to the stage Kate, who's going to be taking us through our keynote. So over to you, Kate. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Johnson. And uh, absolute, absolute pleasure to be, I was going to say pleasure to be here, but I've kind of not really gone anywhere. Um, but uh, to, a pleasure to be joining everybody online. So um, listen, as Johnson said, um, I'm, I'm Kate Lander, CEO of Ivy House. Um, we work with both corporates, but also schools. And, and a big part of the work that we do is, is to try and really change the way that we develop young people. Um, and that's really to help everybody lead, as it says at the bottom of our, of our opening slide, their extraordinary lives. Doesn't matter what people do, but they should have an extraordinary life. Um, now it's gonna be a little bit like a five o'clock government briefing uh, because due to technology, I'm just going to have to roll my slides forward. So, uh, so can we just go next, please? Okay, that picture look familiar uh, for many of you that, that may have worked in London and uh, probably looks like a long time ago, but actually until three years ago that that was my life. Um, I'm not actually in that picture. I don't think I am, but that used to be my, uh, my, my commute home walking over London Bridge. Um, and that was my life that looks now everyone looks pretty miserable. That's the one thing that strikes me and this weird phenomena of going to the office every day. But in that world of working in the city for, for nearly 27 years, um, one thing that really struck me was, was yes, it's male dominated, but it also covers an enormous amount of people from the same background, which inevitably leads to groupthink. Um, I, I spent many years in the asset management side of things where it's been proven that that, that variety um, is, is, is just so important and that level of diversity. So three years ago, I left the city. Um, I made the brave decision to go and find my purpose and uh, have been with Ivy House um, just doing that. Now, today, talking about equal opportunity and social mobility, I'm preaching to the converted with you lot. I've got the easy task. This isn't a case of winning you over. But what I would like to do is really try and think around some of the differences that we can make. And just picking up where we are right now with everything that's going on with the pandemic, really thinking about this impact of COVID and how, what, what impact has it got around social mobility and how can we change that? Now, it's often been said that COVID is probably unique of all the black swans to, uh, to coin a financial phrase that, that's come along. Um, it's probably unique in that it's impacted everybody. So I was a banker, I was, was running a sales and trading desk during uh, Lehman's collapse, collapse, the unthinkable happened, but the financial crisis didn't impact everybody, didn't impact every country, didn't impact every generation. We thought that was probably the biggest things to happen in our lives. But COVID has impacted everybody, but the thing is, it hasn't impacted everybody in the same way. So can just have the next slide. Um, I'd just like to think through some of the, the probably the three standout things for me um, observing the, the COVID pandemic. The first thing is, is that although perhaps medically least impacted, COVID will have a greater long term impact on younger generations than any other generation. Let's just look at a couple of the quick facts. Next, please. Um, a third of 18 to 24 year old employees, excluding students, have lost their jobs or been furloughed. That is an incredible number when people are meant to be starting out in the working world. Can you just click on to the next one? And this is even greater impacted when we look at young people from households of a low income. They're even more likely to have lost their job or had their hours cut during a lockdown. So actually, the, these are the people that are going to suffer the more. And let's not forget that this is coming on the back of Brexit, that thing that was never off the front page or the headlines for, for two years and, and now barely gets a look in. Have the next slide, please. The second thing that has become really clear is that COVID doesn't impact everybody or parts of society in the same way. Uh, next slide. Um, Obviously, at, at, at a point in time, I remember, I remember reading at, at one point during the pandemic, I think it was probably about the end of, um, end of April, 80% um, of children around the world 
were out of school. Now, that is just the most incredible phenomena. And that didn't impact children in all of the same way. During the lockdown, children from better off families were spending 30% more time on home learning than those from deprived backgrounds. It, it doesn't just stop there. Disadvantaged students, obviously a, a huge area for, for Bright Network. One of the challenges is, is that many of them work. It's the only way that they can afford to go through the enormous cost of university. Those jobs disappear and the dropout rates will go up. So this isn't impacting everybody in the same way. Have the next slide. The third one is that improved social mobility is, is beneficial to businesses and the whole economy. Now, that's an obvious statement. I'm preaching to, to people that believe this, but the next statistics blew my mind. Can I just have the next slide? If we improved the UK social mobility score just to the next performer in Europe, which is Netherlands, we would see the UK's economy boosted by around 6%. That's equivalent to £1,650 per person or £108 billion in total. Just click on to the next part of that statement if you can. If we even went further and caught up with the European average, our economy would be boosted by 9%, £2,620 per person or £170 billion in total. Now, they sound enormous numbers, but let me put that into context of the cost of COVID, because that's something anybody that listened to Richie Sunak's statement yesterday would have heard an enormous amount that the impact on this economy. So the World Economic Forum has estimated, that, so these are, these are some estimates. Let me just back it up with one more stat that the World Economic Forum have estimated at about 140 billion a year, the cost of social mobility. So it doesn't matter which way you look at it, we're looking at, at big numbers there. We've got 108, 140 and 170. That's kind of our ballpark of the cost of social mobility. Compare that to the cost of COVID. Yesterday, Richie Sunak announced that COVID had been 280 billion Pounds. That's what it was going to cost us. The cost of furlough, uh, one of those words that most of us have never used in our lives before 2020, the cost of furlough is £41 billion pounds at the end of October. They're all massive numbers, but just looking at the impact that social mobility has, it could help us recover the cost of COVID. COVID is the biggest thing. It is the biggest spend by government since the war. Social mobility can improve our economy by about the same numbers. Okay, we've got a huge opportunity. So look, that's a, that's a clarity of some of the facts. The things that have really stuck out to me, but I'd, I'd like to just use the rest of this session to maybe put some challenges in our minds. There is no doubt that we need government action. We need a global effort to make some of this change, but we also all have a part to play. Now, I also think we've got an opportunity with every crisis comes opportunities. We've got an opportunity to do things that are different to before. So my ask for you is, can I have the next slide? Oh, that's a strange picture, okay? What does, oh, can just go, go, go back up one. Um, why a strange picture? My ask to you is to think like a man called Michael, Michael Michalko. He's the author of a book called Thinker Toys. And he writes extensively around what he calls assumption reversals. Now, assumption reversals is really about turning things completely upside down and on their head to totally disrupt conventional thinking patterns. And I think COVID gives us the opportunity to do this. As a personal experience, we had to do this in our business. On the 1st of March, we had a business for all of our corporates which solely relied on us delivering face-to-face -face training experiences. Our whole USP, our whole approach was that we put people in a room together and did things completely differently. We have a whole lot of hugging, tears and high fives that go on on our programs. That was our thing. Our thing was to get deeply personal, was to get people spending that time together. The 1st of March, we realized that was not gonna carry on. We had to completely turn our business on its head. 
we had to literally sit there and go, not how do we do this online, but how do we make it even better? How do we assume that we will never, ever get people in a room together again and have even more impact because it's needed more than ever? Some of our clients didn't believe us, to be fair. We couldn't reverse their assumptions. We have a client who we, we do a big in-house program for. They didn't believe it. They were all for deferring to 2021. Um, I'm incredibly proud to say that we did that program. We finished it last week and we got a net promoter score of 100. That's better than last time we did it face to face. So we had to completely disrupt. We had to go back. It wasn't about, oh, let's just stick it on Zoom. So my challenge is, is why don't we use this opportunity and change the way that we think? Now, why now? Well, we were just having a chat before this session kicked off about how these events used to be in person. And we all used to worry about whether the tube network was working and whether there was a crisis and people weren't going to be able to get there or not. We've all switched to doing this online. We've all switched, we've changed the way we use technology. Those of us that are in, a, in an office-based environment, we're never going back to the way it was before. This is as big as the industrial revolution. It's the workplace revolution that's gonna happen. And I think we've got the opportunity to use technology, not as that thing that has actually deteriorated our well-being and increased the pressure on us in the late night emails, but we've got an opportunity to actually change the way that we work and use that for the good of social mobility, inequality and equal opportunity. So in terms of looking at that, um, we've been working with some brilliant partners, like people like Bright Network, who like us have been ripping up the way we do things. And I'd like to think through how we can use this to change and improve our social mobility. And I'm gonna put them into the three different buckets that we've been seeing, uh, we've been seeing and working with. So you could just flip to the next slide for me. My first challenge is all about awareness. How can we use technology to increase the awareness amongst young people? Because it's not just about opening doors. We've got to make sure that the right people know where those doors are. If you just flick on to the next slide. One of the challenges is, is that although we may, might, things, may, might make things available, it's still not possible. And so this is another stat that, that, that has somebody who, who used to work in the city and as somebody that used to run internship programs at a bank, um, it, it really horrifies me that, that actually we're eliminating most people by these physical programs. Because the minimum cost of working in an unpaid internship in London is estimated at over a thousand pounds a month. That is just ruling out the ability, the awareness, the ability for young people from certain backgrounds to be able to learn and increase their knowledge. We have to change that. Um, obviously, many of you will have seen the amazing work that Bright Network did on their intern internship experience. Um, I was lucky enough to hear some of the stats, and I really hope I'm not stealing the team's thunder here, but 120,000 applications, 60,000 people completed the internships and a million hours of free training, and not one person had to go anywhere. That is mind blowing. The level of awareness of opportunities, level of knowledge, engagement with employees that you could achieve through that probably something that had never been thought of before COVID. Next slide, next challenge. How can we also use technology to give young people the skills and confidence to apply? So even when they know a little bit more about what they want to do, still a huge leap making that, that leap to actually apply, to give them the confidence to think that they can really go for it. Uh, just on the next slide, please. One of the things that we, we often see is that um, Social Market Foundation did a piece of research where graduates from poor London homes, this wasn't a case of not being near. These were kids that were nearby. That wasn't the barrier. The barrier was that they didn't have the self-confidence or the soft skills, the life skills to really go for that. 
Um, as well as working with corporates at Ivy House, we also have a programme that we put into schools. Um, it's called the Ivy House Award. And it, it really covers life and leadership skills. And it's a 20 unit programme that, that takes 17 to 18 year olds through a programme which really helps them just try and understand how to live their best lives, uh, what their values are, what their personal pitch is, what their impact is, how to have conversations, how to build relationships. We've just, the beauty of it is, is it's all online. So we've been working with the most amazing partner in that West group. Um, I think they're also actually uh, one, of, one of Bright Network's clients. Um, and we've been just running a competition this week. We've closed it to fully fund a thousand children through for, from places of weak social mobility, cold spots across the UK to go through the Ivy House Award. These are amazing opportunities. We can make a difference. My final challenge, just on the next slide, We've spoken about awareness. We've spoken about giving them the right skills. We give them the ability to leap through that door. They're now in the jobs. How do we make them and support them thrive, not just survive? Too often working in the city and in the finance sector, um, I saw too many entry level stats looking great. We've seen it now across universities as well. Entry level statistics are brilliant. The reality is, is that the dropout and exit rate of people from uh, backgrounds that aren't as prosperous are way, way higher. So we've got to help support them even when they've gone through that door. Just on the next step, on the next uh, slide, please. Um, one of the pieces of research that was done by the Social Mobility Commission recently was, even though entry level stats are looking better, we're not supporting them thereafter. Movers will earn on average 33% more than stayers. Those are also people that are more likely to have a degree. They're also more typically likely to navigate, gravitate towards London and the Southeast and end up in, in higher paid jobs. For some people, maybe they've got caring responsibilities. They don't have the financial backing. They're still supporting people at home. Those opportunities just aren't open to them. Now, one of the most amazing things about technology is, is that we've all believed we can do our jobs remotely. I've got a husband who still works in the city for 30 years. He's told me he couldn't possibly ever do his job from home. He's now told me he's never going to do his job from the office five days a week. The world has changed out of all recognition. We have an opportunity to change where people do their jobs. Let's take that and increase our diversity within our workplace, allow people not to be bound by childcare to get home and pick up the kids because that's the only way that they can do it. So just onto the next slide, just to wrap up, I've got one final question for you. Those are the two projects that I've mentioned. Um, just onto the next slide, my final question for you. What assumptions are you going to reverse? Um, if anybody wants to get in contact or ask any questions, please, please do. Uh, my details are just on the next page as well. But, but thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Kate. That was really, really interesting and some great stats and insights there for us to, to think about throughout the rest of today's um, session. Um, before we move into the panel discussion, which Kate will also be joining us um, on, we did just want to um, see that you we still had you with us. So we've got a quick poll question for you. We regularly get asked at Bright Network by employers, what are the best ways to kind of measure and track social mobility? So we're really keen to kind of get your perspective on this. So which indicators of social mobility do you track in your early talent recruits? If you could please submit your answers um, and we can we can share that with you. Right, that's really interesting. So quite a few of you not yet tracking social mobility as part of your kind of diversity metrics. We can just get a few more people responding. We've got 8% currently first generation to attend university as a kind of key metric, but, but more of you actually using a combination of, of metrics to, to track social mobility. Okay, great. All right, so we'll, 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 we'll end it there. It seems that the vast majority are not yet, not yet tracking uh, social mobility. 
So after this, uh, after this uh, webinar, what we'll be doing is we we'll be pulling a bit of a report together for the last three sessions so that we can kind of share that data um, back with you. Um, but yeah, really, really pleased to kind of be onto the final part of, of, of today's uh, webinar, which is our panel discussion. So we're really lucky to be joined by um, two of our employer partners, Legal in General um, and Clyde and Co. But first of all, I wanted to introduce um, our members um, who are also on the call. So Hilary and Josiah, we've learned at, at Bright Network that listening to members, listening to what their experience is, um, really kind of sets us up for the for the kind of best success in terms of moving the dial on, on social mobility and on diversity more generally. So really, really keen to hear what they have to say. Um, I'll come to you first, Hilary. Hilary, can you tell us a little bit more about, about yourself and uh, what you're currently doing? Um, hi, everyone. So my name is Hilary Odunayo. I'm, I actually recently turned 20 on Sunday. I'm a first year undergraduate at the University of Warwick and I study global sustainable development and business. Um, regarding my background, um, I come, I live in South London, so I come from a single parent household, so I didn't really grow up with a lot. Um, I've got one sibling, and I generally speaking don't share this, but I think after seeing the poll that Johnson shared, I think it is quite important. I do share this for awareness, so sadly at a point in my life I was homeless, so that was between year 11 to year 13, so I did have quite a lot of housing issues, I was moving around a London a lot and I'm sharing this mainly because I feel like when it comes to social mobility it's not really raised a lot a lot of people don't know about it it's generally speaking in regards to the poll that indicated that was there is not spoken about and I say this because um in a lot of applications they said some the free school meals is quite common but because at certain points in my life I wasn't eligible for free school meals I didn't qualify for quite a few social mobility um, programs, at least the ones that were out there, but I think most people would agree that I do come from a low socioeconomic background, so I do think it's quite important to share that just because of tiny things like that. So maybe including things like um, has your has your family ever received income support from the government or something like that, I think that would be a very good indicator if companies are looking for um, indicators to put down. <laughs> and I'd say regarding programs that I have been on, I think in regarding to things that, I help, that have helped me get to where I am today, I would definitely say access programs have definitely been a big lifesaver. I definitely agree with Kate's statistical, sorry, statistics about not having the soft skills previously. So in the sixth form, I was part of Pathways to Bank and Law at the at LSE. And I was also on a program called Target Oxbridge, where it was meant to help people of Afro-Caribbean descent get into Oxford and Cambridge. And those two programs did a lot for me in terms of giving me soft skills, and just, just exposing me to what was out there, because I didn't really know a lot about finance. I didn't know a lot about what was out there, how to get to certain places, spring weeks. I'd, they just put me in the right environment to help me learn and develop myself. Um, furthermore, I'm also a holder of the Lloyds of London bursary. And that has, generally speaking, been life changing for me. So it give, they give me £5,000 per year while at university to help me study. And that really does help me with my living costs. It helps me do what I want to do, explore my interests further. So I'd say a prime example is um, I'm currently on the executive team for a thing called Africa Summit at work, where we invite African leaders to speak about issues that affect Africa. And if not for the bursary, I don't think I'd be able to do it because I'd probably be working instead. And I feel like, especially when you're applying to things like spring weeks, internships, people want to see experience. They want to see people that, um, they want to see that you've explored your interests. They want to see that you can take on leadership positions. I think that's a very common theme I've seen in applying for my spring weeks. And you generally speaking may not be able to do it to the same extent if you're if you're working instead on the weekends. But yeah, that's a bit about me. Thank you so much, Hilary, and thanks for being so kind of candid with your experience. I definitely think there's some real highlights our employers can kind of learn from, from, from your perspective. The importance of that early intervention and, and um, supporting with, with soft skill development, as you mentioned. The um, 
importance of recognizing broader ways to bring in people from a low socioeconomic background than the kind of preferred t terms like free school meals and things like that. So yeah, I think really, really useful um, insight. Um, Josiah, welcome um, also to the, to the call. I know you're slightly um, further along in your, in your kind of um, journey. So yeah, I'm really interested to first of all, to hear, hear what you're up to at the moment. And then if you could just kind of touch on some of the challenges that you think people from low socioeconomic backgrounds face when they are entering that kind of competitive uh, recruitment process. For sure. Um, good morning, everyone, and thanks uh, uh, for the introduction. Um, uh, I, I guess I get the short straw because I'm coming after Hillary on this one, so this is a quite unfortunate for me, but I, I'll, I will try to explain uh, what I do on, on my journey. Um, so I'm, I'm currently teach uh, law at uh, the London School of Economics. Um, I'm also deputy chair of the Sutton Trust Alumni Leadership Board. Um, and I've had that position now for about a year and I've been involved in the Sutton Trust and Social Mobility for about five years now. And my first engagement with them was uh, through uh, Sutton Trust Summer School at the University of Cambridge in 2015. Um, and I guess my journey to, to, to through that or to get to there um, is very similar to, to, to Hillary's. Um, I come from a low socioeconomic background. I was very eligible for, for, for free, free school meals. I went to a school uh, called Frederick Bremer School. And if anybody's ever heard of that, it was on the Educating the East End Channel 4 TV series. Um, so we were uh, we were notorious for uh, having a certain flavor in the way our, the character of our school was. Um, I think less than 50% of my year actually achieved a C in maths and English. Um, in the year that I graduated. So um, in terms of, of the background where I'm coming from, state school educated, humble beginnings, uh, my my mum my unemployed, my father working in security. So um, I, I, I had very humble, a very humble background starting out. And then I went to the LSC and I found that my low socioeconomic background affected probably um, two key things. Firstly, my confidence. Um, I definitely felt like I wasn't to the same level as my peers I felt like I needed to work harder be smarter um, and I, I generally felt like I couldn't engage um, as much as what was going on and then secondly it was fitting in um, so there was nobody who looked like me you know who'd come from the same background and I think it really shot, shot out to me when in my first year I was coming to university in a full tracksuit and everybody else was coming in Oxford and Brogues and I was thinking to myself well where have I got myself where where, where, where actually am I um, so uh, very lucky Luckily, I had mentors, I had the assistance of people from the Bright Network, and I found myself in a community in a group of people who sought out and saw that I was a young man, a young black man who had the opportunity and the potential to do well, if only um, he was given enough assistance and support and guidance, especially as my family had no relationship with law, no understanding of the law process um, and what was going on. I was dealing with with familial problems in the, my, during the second year of my university, my dad was uh, paralyzed and so I had to be effectively become a carer and then substantially support my family throughout, throughout that entire exercise. So it, it definitely was a big thing that I found other people who came in and provided some sort of support. Thankfully, along the way, I, I graduated from the LSC and then I went off to Harvard where I studied as a Kennedy Scholar um, and I graduated um, last year and now I'm also doing a master's at Oxford um, and again I have had the benefit of, of scholarships which have helped me to to go along that path um, but I guess the story is that I guess today I can I can say that I, I I've achieved something and I feel much more confident and self-assured in myself but starting out as that young 16 year old I definitely felt so many problems so many issues that were before me of navigating systems navigating um uh, application forms you know, how do I how do I present myself are they going to like the fact that I have an afro are they going to like the fact that um, I, I come I have an East London accent and that is going to perhaps affect how they understand me or, or so so there were so many things that subconsciously which were, which were affecting uh, me in the application process and how I wanted to perform um, uh, so so uh, I, I would say that there's a lot of work that probably still needs to be done and I see it all the time now that I have 
have the benefit of teaching at the LSE of how people from disadvantaged backgrounds require maybe just a little bit more support, maybe a few words of encouragement um, to make sure and, and enable them to achieve the success that we know that they can do, right? Because as clearly seen from Kate's uh, wonderful presentation, the gap is there, the opportunity is there, um, if only we were to, to seize it and help those who can, who can grow and um, excel to their to finest potential. Thank you so much, Josiah. That's really, really helpful insight. And congratulations on all your kind of academic accolades so far. It sounds like you're really kind of powering through. <laughs> so um, I did have one more question for you, um, Josiah, which was just to get your reflections on what you think about employers who name activity, name initiatives for people from low socioeconomic backgrounds. Is that helpful? Or is, is that, does that not feel so great? No, for sure. It's a great question. I think it, it, it follows a little bit of a double-edged sword. And, you know, in some ways we've got to take what might feel a bit of, uh, a, bit of a, a targeting um, and, and use that actually as a platform to grow. Because I think the whole idea of all these diversity schemes, these initiatives are, they want to become redundant one day, right? They, they're all for you. We don't want to continue to ha have to have these conversations about social mobility and in including people from diverse backgrounds and, and, and things like this. So for now, today, yes, perhaps there needs to be much more of a focus in terms of initiatives that focus on, you know, African Caribbean society. I, I was speaking to to um, a barrister the other day from a Magic Circle Chambers, and um, he was talking about his conversations in the city and and how uh, you know there, there's often a question employees put forward is then you know, how can we find black talent? You know, where where is it? You know, where are the talent from minority ethnic backgrounds? And and almost the question is, you know. They don't exist but it's just not true right because if they if you know they you went to societies you went to the universities you went onto campus you organize these diversity schemes you organize these initiatives well then you know the, you, you'll see the talent it'll, it'll arise and you know, at times you know when they when you start out at university in your first and second year you may not have those grades just yet because you've been further behind your peers for, for a significantly period, long period of time and it will take you a while to show off those other qualities which make you an outstanding candidate and it, it, I think it's a full um, you might you might say I mean it's a good approach and it's and it's an approach which requires a full understanding from all the participants and stakeholders to realize that you know this is only a short-term solution to the medium term we are looking and striving towards a, a better more concrete long-term goal and we can achieve it if we have that mind if we have that mindset you know we shouldn't think that the quote quotas or things like this are some sort of um, eternal uh, thing which will always be there that would be the wrong approach I think to, to looking at these diversity schemes and naming initiatives to target um, certain groups in, in our society which are un underrepresented. Great thank you very much and just um, before we move on to the employers Hillary, I did have one more question for you which is you know you're still quite early on in your university career but when you get to the point where you start making applications to different employers based on what you've told us about your background and your experience, what are you going to be looking for from an, from an employer that, that, that kind of you're happy to, to work for? Um, I'd say one thing I, I do look for is support, a place that I know that will help me progress, a place that if I need something, there are tools, there are frameworks there that even if someone doesn't know how to specifically get that support, there's almost a pipeline of progression. I think that's one thing that's very important to me. Just somewhere, I think a lot of people do look for this, but sometimes when you don't have the knowledge, the soft skills, mentors, knowing how to navigate certain fields. I know there's a lot of talk about workplace politics, just tiny things like that. I think if there, if there was either a scheme or mentorship program or just frameworks there to allow you to integrate yourself better into an into your company that's one thing I was I'm really looking for and during my introduction there was one thing I did forget to say so I don't know if someone will ask the question or you will just allow me to say it later but I just thought I'd put it out there yeah sure just say it now if you like um I think one key thing I really did want to speak about um as a student because like I said I'm in first year so I'm 
going through the spring week application phase or if you're into corporate law it's um i guess spring week as well or early vacation schemes and with everything being virtual one thing i definitely have seen is the high startup costs um in regards to getting very good equipment you may not be able to see it but i've got a ring light behind behind my laptop right now to make sure my lighting is very good. I think that's a very prime example of tiny costs that people may not think about during recruitment because I was told that lighting, especially with things being online, is extremely important. And I do know some companies do, um, they have it slightly automated. So something like, like something like not having the right equipment, the right technology right now, which is a very high startup cost in addition to the, generally speaking, quite high startup cost as well. Like I've got, I've got an iPad with me as well as a laptop. Not everyone is able to afford a high pay, a very high quality laptop like I am just because I have the bursary, which has allowed me to afford things like this. Yeah, no, that's a really, really important point is that to kind of recognise from a recruiter's perspective just how much costs are incurred by, by students when they're kind of making applications and obviously trying to mitigate against that. Thank you so much, Hilary and Josiah. Um, so I'm going to move on to um, our employer partners. Ashley, I know you've been bursting with energy for the last 40 minutes, so I'm going to come to you uh, first of all. Um, could you just first of all obviously say who you are and then just tell us about some of the initiatives you You've undertaken at Clyde and Co to ensure that you're able to recruit people from low socioeconomic backgrounds and to kind of bring your hiring managers on board as well. Great, thank you, Jansen. Hi to everyone, and um, thank you for having me here. So, yeah, my name is Ash. Um, I'm the Early Careers Recruitment Manager for Clyde and Co, a law firm, um, and I focus on recruitment for apprentices and graduates across the UK and the Middle East. And this is a subject that both I personally am quite passionate about as well as Clyde and Co. And I think this session that I'm about to talk about and what we do will tie up quite nicely from the stats that we've heard from Kate and then the experiences from the members have had trying to break into different industries when, it, when you're coming from a lower socioeconomic background. And so at Clyde and Co, we started engaging with universities um, and schools quite a long time ago, but we found our return on investment wasn't always there with where we were putting our money. So then we started to do a more targeted approach um, at different universities and schools to make sure that we were giving access to all. And when it came to social mobility, we had a first year program that we launched in 2017 called Bright Futures, which is giving first year law students and second year non-law students access to the profession. However, last year we decided to focus and target social mobility candidates to ensure that people that historically wouldn't have had access to the profession were actually gaining access. So we started to look at what other programs that we could do. So we introduced this first year program, then we broadened it out to schools and we launched our Clyde's Advance program where we started to go to year 12s students across the country to offer mentoring programs from people from disadvantaged backgrounds, giving them the opportunity to get work experience, again, creating access to the profession and touching on what Hillary has just said in terms of financial support. We then started looking across our schemes that we were doing when we were doing lots of socializing and raising the brand, having really high marketing and materials and spending a lot of finances in those areas we thought we could be doing something a little bit better with our financial impact. So we started to look at students that may need support with um, books, materials, and start to sponsor first-generation students that have made it into university, sponsor students that um, may need access to equipment. And we would screen that by using a contextualized recruitment tool, which is something that we use for all of our applications, looking at applications holistically, so taking in different mitigating circumstances, what their background might be, if they had free school meals, if they were first generation, if they had caring responsibilities, and um, if they came and they were living off government support, all of that is captured in this contextualized recruitment tool. And that's how we try to create access for everyone because it's not really about where you've come from, it's more about where you're going. Great, thank you so much. That sounds, I guess, really interesting, a kind of broad range of activities, which, seem, which seems like a really effective approach when it comes to social mobile candidates, taking a number of steps to, to target and, and attract them. Obviously, in this COVID-19 period, we're doing a lot of things virtually. How do you think that's impacted um, attracting people from a low socioeconomic background? 
but yeah it's fantastic and something that we we at Clyde are certainly quite excited by and um, so obviously working with Bright Network we were involved in your program in the summer where we reached thousands of students and kind of picking off um piggybacking off your great idea we rolled it out internally um so previously when we would have inside days or opportunities for students we may have between 30 and 50 come to the office depending on what region um we were hosting events now tomorrow we've got an insight day where we have over 300 students attending so we're breaking down the barriers to reach people in in locations we never dreamt possible and we are now seeing the return on investment when it comes to applications because our applications opened on the first of october and we are three times further in to the amount of applications that we have received compared to to previous years so you can see that um unfortunately the pandemic um has brought a lot of sadness and sorrow um, in this area it has been been quite a positive things because you can reach people without having to travel without having to spend and um, without having to leave your home you can still get access to profession and it's breaking down the barriers that people face from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. And do you think some of those virtual advantages you'd look to keep kind of beyond 2021? Oh absolutely yeah it's definitely a hybrid approach at Clyde's where we're going to we have um carried out surveys with students to get their feedback to see if they would still want face to face and I do think there is still a need for that or a demand because you you like to learn from the people that are around you but um, it will definitely be a blended approach to all of our programs going forward so we can create that access um, for everybody. Thank you so much Ash. Um, Christine welcome um, to the call. Obviously your perspective is a little bit different as a co-chair of your your SEM committee. You, you have a, a little bit more of a kind of inside perspective so um, be great to kind of yeah get you to introduce yourself and then just to kind of tell us how important it is to kind of galvanize the support of internal colleagues when it comes to moving the dial on, on social mobility. Yes no thank you. I just want to say thank you all from Bright Network for putting on this event, it's been amazing. Um, and well done to Hillary and Josiah for their achievements so far. It's, it's amazing to see that you guys have come so far. Um, so yeah, so I'm currently um, co-chair, as um, Johnson mentioned, uh, at Elgin for our SEM committee, but I'm also um, a manager at Elgin, um, looking after our uh, investment performance team. Um, so within our, our committee, one thing that I think it's quite unique is that everyone in our committee has their day jobs within Elgin and they have, um, whenever you're involved in the committee, this is everything that's done is done outside of work, outside of working hours and balancing that. And it really shows the type of passion that everyone has around um, STEM issues and trying to resolve that. So some of our top goals that we have within the committee is, um, as you mentioned, is around raising awareness, both internally and externally, of the issues and the impact of the issues of social mobility causes, um, but also inspiring um, uh, students and, and, and other potential employees to come to LGM and, and actually enter the asset management industry and see that their skills can actually um, suit a career in this area. And, often you find with someone from a disadvantaged background or from a, from a STEM background, they often find that these type of roles wouldn't necessarily be for them or they can't get into the industry. So what we try to do is really look at ways in which we can encourage that, um, whether that be from a university stage or secondary school stage or whatever we feel like is, is, is the best way to approach that. That's one of our, our focuses. Um, and our final goal within SEM is to really look at how we support um, colleagues who are currently within within Elgin, but just in the industry itself, um, and how to support them in terms of progression. That's something, especially this year, has been a real focus for us. With, um, I'm, I'm not sure if you guys are aware, there's been a, a, a recent study that's been launched by um, the, Bridge, the Bridge Group that looks at progression within in the industry and looks at how, um, how people from disadvantaged backgrounds or STEM backgrounds are actually um, having the support as, as Hillary mentioned and, and, and what has actually been done to help them progress and the difficulties that they face just generally within work within the industry. Um, so our committee is, is looking at those type of three top level top level goals really. So um, for us, some of the ways that we've been tackling this um, is for example, we have our mentoring programs that we've been running and this is again, all, all run by people within the committee. Um, some of them, we have insight, insight days, we've got virtual insight days as well. Uh, we have a work 
work experience uh, uh, weeks. Um, we run CV workshops. We've partnered up with a lot of other charities. Um, our most recent event, we partnered up with Morgan Stanley. And what that does for us is really kind of raise that awareness across different areas of the industry and different companies within the industry. And the more people you can reach that way, that the more impact you will have. So that's been our, our, our real focus. And another area that we've been um, focused on is attending career fairs um, at secondary school level. Because often what you find, and I don't know if any, anyone else remembers when going to career fairs at secondary school, um, you will have a lot of like the standard type of areas in terms of careers. But asset management isn't one that always goes there because asset management only really gets introduced to a lot of people at let's say university level um, so we're trying to reach the students at a younger age to really show them that okay in the asset management world there isn't just a, a fund manager and a trader as the roles there's other different areas that you can work in and you have the skill from a young age already to potentially work in those areas um, so those are the things that that we've been really pushing within within seminar committee and what I, I'm really really passionate about um, maybe if I give a little bit of background about, about myself as well <laughs> if that's okay Johnson um, so um, I'm originally from from Guyana in South America um, and uh, I, I grew up there to, up until a certain point and moved to Montserrat um, and for some of you who may know some of you probably probably too young to know there was a volcanic eruption in, Mont in Montserrat which resulted in all of us moving to the UK um, so this is how I actually ended up in the UK <laughs> It wasn't intentional um, and once I got here I realized just what um, that I fall into a, a particular SEM class. And that's when I realized in order for me to, to, to do well and to really achieve, um, I've got to work on the things that I'm good at and studying and education was one of those things. So I've always been pushing um, in terms of development of myself and my, my siblings and everyone around me. Um, and I've uh, managed to get to a position in my career now where I'm able to help others. And I feel like when you are in those positions and you are relatable is for me, it's almost like, I feel like it's a duty to help everyone else who potentially could I can relate to me can see that um, I, I've been in their shoes or I can provide some insight that they may not always get. Um, so that's one thing I, I thought just to just to mention there one one point to touch and I know Hillary mentioned about um, almost like having like a starter pack for, for, for employees entering into, into industries who, who don't necessarily have the funds to have all the equipment. That's something that we've been looking at within our committee and posing ideas to our firm and, and to the group and to the C-suites around potentially um, introducing almost like a, like a, a, a grant program for new starters where as they come in um, if they fall into the, the same background and obviously that's that's due to them disclosing that information because it's always it's, it's very personal talking about these type of things is having some form of a grant or, or, or a package that helps them to start because as, as most of you know when you start a, a new job you're often not paid for a good three four weeks so to have the equipment and the things that you need is essential having for example if, if it was in the office it'll be travel having the, the funds to, to pay for travel and travel is expensive is providing that that level of um initial support so already coming into the firm you know the firm is here for you and and it's invested in you and invested in your development um so yeah that's what we're currently looking at some of the things some of the things that we're currently looking at so yeah thank you so much christine and uh, i'm sure many of our listeners will be hitting you up on linkedin to get um <laughs> get, get a few ideas on how far you've come with that so far some really interesting perspectives from um across our uh, panel um i'm aware that there's a few questions from the audience so the last five minutes just want to use that to answer some of those anu over to you thanks johnson and thank you so much to our wonderful panel it's been so informative so i have three questions um, and i think uh we'll start with this question perhaps for christine and aisling so would you advise removing things like names and educational establishments um prior to having interviews and assessments do you think that that would help when perhaps dealing with what we've had written here as elitism in the workplace um so ash or christine uh, do you have any answers uh yeah, definitely. If I if I can go first, I think for for me that's something that is one of the biggest steps that we can take as employers to really get rid of that unbiased um, kind of situations that happen. Because most of the time, as we, as we say, it's 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 
not intentional, but it can happen. Just reading someone's name, you can often tell if they're, if they're from an African descent, you can tell that they are from an African descent. So by removing that and removing um, where they attended university, it really focuses on their actual achievements and what they've actually done. And that's something um, that is important, not just in terms of employment, but in terms of schools. So uh, about a few years ago, I used to be a school governor as well. And um, whilst I was there, one of the debates that we had was about removing the names of students applying to, to attend certain schools. And that's something that I really, really campaigned for because there are lots and lots of students that fall into, into, into SEM that are highly educated, highly driven, but just don't have the opportunity because of maybe um, where they live or, or the schools that they've previously attended or just the simple fact of their name doesn't get them through the door. Um, I've got my own personal um, situation where that's happened. Um, one of my um, roles uh, 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 several years back, um, because if you, if you all you know, see my name, my name is quite a uh, quite British, quite American, whatever it is. Um, I had a situation where I went, for an, I went for an interview and the person who was interviewing me actually came to reception and looked around and then went back, realized, thinking that Christine Meredith wasn't here when I'm actually just sitting right there, um, and came back again and actually asked me what my name was. And for me, that's something where I find, because I, I have, where my name is, is, is quite British and a lot of people don't have that, they already have a disadvantage. So by removing that, it, it levels the playing field, the entry playing field anyway, um, so they, they have the opportunity to at least have an interview. Because yeah. often find that we talk about um, the skills needed for a particular role or the, mm -hmm. or the degree that you need to take to, to enter this industry. But often the biggest challenge is actually just the entry phase, whether that be going through recruiters or going through interviews and just having no barriers or minimal barriers around those areas is, is really essential. So for me, that's something, um, if, if it can be implemented industry-wide, that would be, that'll be amazing because we really want the best yeah. talent based on their skills rather than, than their names. Thank you so much, Christine. Um, Aisha, I'm gonna change the question slightly because we've had another one come in, I think um, it would be helpful to have your thoughts on. So with regards to looking at work experience, often sometimes the barrier to completing work experience is not being able to um, find experience or not being able to afford to go out and travel to do that experience. Is this something you think that employers shouldn't be looking at when looking at graduate applications? Thanks, Anya. Yeah, great question. Thank you for submitting. Um, yeah, I think work experience um, is a difficult one because people often get caught up in focusing on work experience that's relative to the industry, but often work experience has so many transferable skills that um, personally, I worked in, the, in a shoe shop from the age of 16 and those skills that I learned there have helped me to create my career and a lot of them are transferable. So I do think I'm not sure if it's something that employers should move away from because I think often applicants just need to be creative in how they're actually telling their work experience and I often tell candidates even attending a virtual event and the experiences that you get from that you can still pop that down as work experience and having exposure to an industry so I think it is something that shouldn't be heavily weighted by recruiters I don't think um, it should be make or break when it comes to an application I don't think anyone should be shy if they don't have it but I think students should definitely be creative in how they portray their work experience and just because you might be applying for a bank, you don't need to have banking experience or similar for a law firm. Um, any experience is good experience, in my opinion. Thanks so much. Back to you, Johnson. Great, amazing. So if any other questions were asked, we will get them answered for you personally after the call. Um, we are planning to send around all of the slides um, and also we've recorded today's session, so we'll be able to share that with you um, as well. And we're just approaching the final minute. So Kate, it would be great to just kind of get a closing remark from you in terms of um, the discussion today. You have to sum it up in one word, it's excited. I think with, with everything else going on in the world at the moment, it would be really, it's, it's so easy, isn't it, to, for us all to fall into a sort of a negative mindset. But from what I've heard today, there are people out there, people in workplaces, people coming through university, people in our younger community, members at Bright Network that are seizing the opportunity. And I think, I think because there's so much change going on, there is this opportunity to disrupt and turn those assumptions on their heads. So excited after what I've heard. 
Great. Thank you so much, Kate. Thanks everyone for joining us, especially if you've been joining for all of our webinars over the last couple of weeks. Have a, it's weird to say it, but have a lovely, lovely uh, Christmas and New Year break and uh, we'll see you um, in the new year. All right. Take care. Bye.